from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm Emily Crosby. This is December 4th, 2015, and we're in Mississippi Cultural Crossroads in Port Gibson, Mississippi. We're here with the Civil Rights History Project, co-sponsored by the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we're here uh, continuing and expanding on the interview with James Miller and Carolyn Miller that we had this morning. And we also have today Worth Long, David Crosby, Patricia Crosby. And we're going to talk about primarily Mississippi Cultural Crossroads and the work uh, that it did, the sort of cultural and historical and artistic work that it did, both documenting and in the tradition of the Civil Rights Movement. Can, you, can we start by some of you, whoever is so moved, to tell us how Cultural Crossroads was born? Well, maybe I should start because I was the evil genius behind it. <laughs> <coughs> I, uh, I got across my desk came a notice from the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities that was offering youth grants in the humanities for young people to get together and study humanities when they weren't in school or whatever. And uh, I think the grants were for twenty five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And um, I immediately thought that uh, Port Gibson was a kind of unique situation for uh, young people to look at all the various cultures that kind of intersected here in Port Gibson from the Spanish land grant of uh, the, the Natchez territory to the French culture of both uh, the, the Natchez territory and then the U.S. flag flew and the British flag and you know it was a, a whole mixture of things. Of course the, the Native Americans who, who were here when the French arrived in the 1730s. So it's um, yeah, I also thought that uh, my wife Patty, who was unemployed at the time, would be the ideal person to uh, to manage such a, a grant. And uh, as it turned out, uh, they gave it to us. And then at that point, Patty took over and ran, and I just kind of stepped into the shadows and gave <laughs> moral support and material support that I could. And, uh, but the basic idea, I think, came from a sense that um, there were a lot of voices in the history of Claiborne County and Port Gibson that were not really reflected in the official stories that were told by uh, people who had concerned themselves with the history of the region. And, and the most important story that was left untold was that of the African-American presence so um, most of our activities were designed to try to engage both white young people and black young people in conversations about that heritage. And then Patty can tell you what some of the first activities were if you want to go on to that right now. So what year is this? This was 1970. It was a little earlier than that. 76 probably yeah. that we first started for, wrote the first proposal and then it you know went through bureaucratic channels and so on but the first work of cultural crossroads actually was probably in 1977 78 mm -hmm. yeah and it's probably helpful to know in this context that Claiborne County is an 80 percent African-American community mm -hmm. and in 78 if we connect this 76 through 78 if we connect this to what we were talking about earlier this is about three years after African-Americans win a majority on the policy-making board in the county after years of exclusion and so the community can you can somebody want to try to describe kind of what the dynamics of the community was like at the time that that Cultural Crossroads is born? I think <clears throat> it, it, was, it was just so much going on, man. And as you reflect back on it, right, I mean, it was like 
two or three revolutions going on at the same time. All right, you had the influx of Grand Gulf, right? You had a black political takeover. You had uh, established white power that was fighting tooth and nail to maintain control, right? <clears throat> you had uh, the emergence of a baby uh, organization in the community, Mississippi Cultural Crossroads, ran by a white woman <laughs> okay, in a predominantly black community. Right? The worst of all possible worlds. <laughs> but not just your average white woman, <laughs> man. <laughs> okay. uh, anybody know Patty? Y'all know I'm telling the truth, right? She's a very strong, opinionated person, right? And not easily intimidated, right? So that you had you had dumb dynamics going on, and mind you, all of the people that were, that were in control politically were males, mm -hmm. okay? So you got, uh, you got this chauvinistic thing going on. You got, uh, you, know, you got Patty pushing hard, trying to get stuff done. You got uh, 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 an evolving evolution of uh, black leadership, all right, that's coming into power that's never been there before, right? Trying to figure out how they fit into the mix. Then you got a bunch of little fools running around talking about why this white woman running this. I thought it could be some black person, right? They got all that, all that going on, right? So it was, I mean, a lot of friction, a lot of dynamics. Okay. There was Julia Jones. I mean, in terms of yeah, 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 well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm talking about in policy making positions. Yeah, okay. You know, Jones was the, was the uh, uh, circuit, circuit clerk. clerk. Circuit. All right, but the folks that had the money <laughs> mm -hmm. went on the board of supervisors. <laughs> but yeah, well. So what were some of the early organizations, and what's the relationship between the I'm not organization early activities? And what's the relationship between the grant, cultural crossroads, and those early activities? The $2,500 planning grant we got from the NEH enabled us to say we had a grant, say we had money, which was absolutely critical. Nobody ever asked how much. And then to gather together people in the community. Dave was teaching at Alcorn in a master's program, so he was teaching some of the teachers in the community. So that's how he got to know both your teachers and others in the community. And I'm not sure how we made a contact with Chamberlain Hunt Academy, but on that early board there were a couple of people. And Worth was in and out of town in those days. So we gathered together that group of people, and there were high school kids on that board, and said, what do we want to do? So what's Chamberlain Hunt Academy? Uh, well, it was the private segregationist academy. I mean, it had a, a history before the war where it was a military academy for boys. But when the court said, finally, you must, what did they say, integrate or desegregate? I don't know which word. Um, the schools, then Chamberlain Hunt Academy started accepting white girls um, and local boys that had not before that been there. So it was an alternative school to the public schools. And so, um, what, well, go ahead. so anyway, we just met every couple of months and talked about what we wanted to do. And the upshot of that was the high school kids essentially said, we'll do anything, even talk to the old people, if you'll get us cameras and show us how to use them. And that was a time before everybody had a cell phone with a camera on it. So that those Canon 35 millimeter cameras and the dark room that we set up were really uh, an important thing for the high school kids, I think. Um, and then just very early on, Worth, who sat at the table with us, was at that point on a panel, panels, for the NEA folk life, folklore program. And so we talked about what did we want. We wanted tape recorders, we wanted a dark room, we wanted cameras. And Worth on a panel got us $9,000, I think. But then again, dynamics were there. You couldn't, I couldn't as a person apply to the NEH. But there was a library in town and we had asked Nancy, the librarian, to be on our board. So we said, Nancy, can the, board, can the library accept this $2,500 if we get it? She said, sure. None of us even ask what the NEH was going to require, and they require a 501c3 or something else. 
This library was just a library, the oldest one in the state, but it wasn't what. So I went to the supervisors and I said, I've got this money, but I can't accept it for the community. Um, I need to have a government body or a 501c3. Do you remember the white lawyer from Natchez who was the board lawyer in those days? Anyway, he was sitting at the table yeah. and I went in, hat in hand. Zicario. Zicario. Yes, Zicario. exactly. Yeah. Good job. Um, and I, I said, you know, I need somebody to accept this grant. And he looked at the board and he said, what can she do with $2,500? <laughs> well, actually, that wasn't the $2,500. This was the... No, that was the first one. Oh, okay. And then that was the first one because the library had said they could but couldn't. And then when we got the NEA money, mm -hmm. we had already figured out at the house that we needed to be a 501c3. I couldn't go around asking people to accept money for us. But the second money came through the school board. Okay. Um, which is another major miracle, because I really never had a very good relationship with the superintendent, but they accepted that money. Then he wouldn't give it to me. I don't know whether you remember that, because, well, I assume you've talked about the school issues, but... We the, haven't really, so you might need to... That was a good thing. <laughs> at just about this point, the schools lost their accreditation, and Emily and some of her classmates um, we're playing basketball and the major upshot of losing your accreditation is that you lose the right to play in high school athletics so that these kids who are very good were bumped aside so Dave and I and Reggie Porter's mother Was and did Franny's mom Katie Young join that party just those sure. At any rate, we filed suit against the High School Activities Association, and the superintendent took that as a personal affront. We said it wasn't him, it was the children, but so he had this money from the NEA and he wouldn't give it to us for about a year. It sat there and we just kept spending and hoping. So anyway, that would... Then we got started interviewing people, and I ain't lying, and that was a start. But some of that was going on before the school stuff, because I was almost, I was about to graduate when that happened, and, and Octavia and all of them were doing I Ain't Lying long before that, right? Yes, I yeah, think so. Yeah, you're right. So I'd like to go back and provide a little background to those activities, because Patty and I had, had come to uh, Claiborne County in 73, and we had been, you know, reading the whole Earth catalog and that kind of thing. And we had, uh, through them, had learned about uh, Wigington and the Foxfire Project. And so we were, we had really that kind of model in line of mm -hmm. going to the, the elders in the community, and in our case, particularly the African American elders in the community, to get them to talk about their lives and their crafts and their um, traditions and things like that. So that's kind of where I started. But then we, we got in touch with Brother Worth here, and he enriched that a, a lot by um, infusing us with this sense of the um, what, what was uh, maximum feasible participation uh, so that uh, the, the institution tried to be as representative as it could be of the people that it was um, trying to reach. It's participatory you know, yeah. democracy. Exactly. The, the, yeah. the, the, the concept. And shortly yeah. after we moved here, the Chamber of Commerce published something called Claiborne County, the Promised Land. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there was a big book signing and opening at the chamber, so Dave and I on a Friday afternoon went. You know, why not? We were new in the community. You could read that several inch book and not know that there were any African Americans in this community except the pages because the pages had caused trouble. And Back I just. Back in Reconstruction or slavery. Yeah, yeah, they had caused trouble, but they still made the book. Um, but so. Well, so, I, did, so did the slave who, 
who saved the That's family true. from burning the when one. the chimney caught fire. But I, I said to people, you could read this book in Michigan and not know that 80% of this population in this community is African American. So that was another kind of driving force for um, encouraging people to talk about their lives, to tell their stories. And we started out interviewing just whoever the kids wanted to interview. Um, yeah, we let them take the lead very much. And they, as, as you said, they were so thrilled to get a hold of a tape recorder and a, and a camera and be able to do something with it that uh, they became eager to, uh, to do that. But may I go on? Uh, the, or did you? The, I think, most important thing that happened during that first year uh, was that by the end of it, we, we realized that uh, the people, well, one of the strongest artistic traditions in the county was quilting, and that there were a lot of parents and grandparents of these children who were quilters. And so there, there was a kind of um, critical mass of artists who were going completely unrecognized in the community. And so we, uh, one of the first things was Patty and I wrote a, a paper, a kind of show and tell that we took to a meeting of the Mississippi Folklore Society. And we, we showed a, a number of, well, before that, I guess, there, there was, the, we were able to, to go to the Mississippi Arts Commission then and get some uh, grants, small grants to um, work in the schools with uh, resident artists. And our resident artists were folklore artists, folk artists. And the most popular one was the quilting. We also had uh, a blues and sculpting one with Son Thomas. And uh, I, I'm not sure what, how this fit, but we, we actually got um, the, uh, the old blues singer from the Delta. Sam Chapman. Sam Chapman performed at the um, uh, movie house. Uh, that was different money. It was different money, but it was, you know, with, but that was the basic mm -hmm. idea, getting the, the, the kids involved, uh, being taught by the people who were the actually the artists in the community or in nearby communities, the extended black community, if you will. And the, uh, that led to, I think, a recognition that, uh, oh, going on, the, the paper we, we wrote, trying to show that basically black quilts operated on a, a kind of different aesthetic level than the traditional white quilts, which were based on squares that were perfect and added together all contributed to one pattern. Whereas in African-American quilts, by and large, uh, grew kind of organically from a set of procedures, a way of building a quilt that led to different things, like quilts that were based on long strips of material rather than squares. Or if they were squares, they were then made into long strips before they were put together, and so on. But uh, we presented this paper at the Mississippi Folklore Society up in Oxford that particular year. And I remember going to the um, restroom after the presentation, and the chairman that year of the uh, Folklore Society uh, l looked at me from the next urinal and said, you don't really believe all that crap, do you? <laughs> And, you know, I was certainly taken aback because he was a, but they did believe it. a a friendly young fellow, and I did believe what what I was saying. I thought, but there's a there's a disconnect here somewhere. I'm not making myself clear to the people that I would think would be most sympathetic to the point I'm trying to make. And we've been kind of trying to to make that disconnect into a connect uh, ever since. Uh, but that's, that's how we really got involved, I think, in the kind of programming that Cultural Crossroads then became 
known for a quilting program, uh, the um, theater arts program, the documentation. Can we, I want to, we're going to, because of our timing, I want to come back to some of that file. Worth, can you say, Worth, can you talk about, you're coming out of working with SNCC right. in the 60s, mm -hmm. and then how do you come into contact with Cultural Crossroads and what's in your mind at this, at the birth of this organization and this work? All right. Tell me when. We're, we're all. Yeah. Um, my, my, my background was uh, in, in, in the civil rights uh, and, and organizing uh, was in the, with the civil rights movement, working with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. And uh, um, um, during that particular time, during, during the the, the period in which the uh, cultural crossroads was developed, uh, I was already involved in trying to do in Southwest Mississippi a program that was. Uh, I came on the board in 1980, so in 1977 uh, I was involved in a uh, Ford Foundation program that that was called what. Leadership, Leadership Development Program, uh, in which they uh, funded me to, to do some uh, um, study and, and research. Uh, part of that study was with, with Alan Lomax in, in the, uh, at Columbia University. He was there at that time. And what, what, the stu what, what my study was about, basically it was the whole question of how can you and this relates to cultural crossroads, how can you, in communities that are not empowered, uh, legitimize the program that is already culturally compact and, and developed within the community, but is not respected in the larger community? Um, uh, it, it's almost a parallel in terms of what the civil rights movement was trying to do in, 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 during that same time. So you're, you're asking, asking the question, you're talking about, uh, we, we, in the civil rights movement we're talking about uh, racial equality, but here we're talking about cultural equality. How can we be sure that people, uh, but especially oppressed people, people who are outside the limits of the society, how can they, in fact, be respected, not just based on their numbers and the work that they do, but on what they contribute to the, uh, the education arts and culture of, the, of, of their communities and of the larger communities. So those were some of the things that I was looking at and trying to see what are the forms that can be developed that can address that. What are the institutional forms that can do that? Uh, institutional and cultural forms that can do that. And I, uh, when I saw people talking uh, here in Southwest Mississippi, about trying to do something for a community that that had legitimate cultural expression, but did not have an avenue for pa even passing that forward to their 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 own within their culture to their own kids, mm -hmm. right? And and could and were looked down on by the local gentry, then. What, what I said was, what you can do probably is you can organize people uh, in a grassroots way so that they can be exposed to not just the, the, the classics, the, uh, of, 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 of European classics, but also of the classics of, 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 that developed 
and the culture that develops just in in the local community right um, and we talked about some of that uh, in 1980 when I when I first came in the other thing that I remember contributing at that time was my experience as an organizer in trying to be sure that everybody was involved at every level in the, uh, of the organization so that when you start to organize something then you're not just dealing with the preachers and the teachers you're not and 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 the people who who sell things in the community but you're dealing with the grassroots folk who are just working class ordinary working class people who have a wealth of culture and 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 are are the the real foundation for the entire community not just in terms of economics but also in culture so how can you deal with with organizing them and in such a way that the wealth of their community, the treasure of their community, can be passed forward. Uh, and Cultural Crossroad was talking about how they could do that by showing them, by reflecting to, to them uh, uh, the, the, the beauty of what, the, of what they had, right? And you can do that in two, uh, several different ways. You know, you can, you can convince them uh, by showing, by comparing what they have with something else. But one of the most important ways you can do it in many cases is that you can popularize it in a larger society. And then they say, well, wait, this, this stuff that, that, I, that I thought didn't uh, mean anything, in this case, a hill of beans, <laughs> that didn't mean a hill of beans, is really something, and quilting is is the best example I think of that, because once, once, once somebody is dealing with something that they consider is just something to keep you warm, and they see that it it, it gets a pri a national prize, then y y you don't have to convince people to have more quilters, <laughs> right? And so notice I did not use the economic element, that, that uh, there's an economic value in, in that. That comes along. But the cultural element, and then uh, I remember once you had begun to organize, you, the storytelling quilts started to, to develop within the, the repertoire of, 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 of uh, I, 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 I can't. Uh, can we redirect? Can I redirect for a moment? Yeah, I would. I want to come back to this, but in uh, the next fifteen minutes or so, some of the, some of the things though that seem, uh, that stood out for me as really important historically, uh, not uh, in in engaging the history. It um, are uh, the the two exhibitions, picturing our past and no yeah. easy journey, okay. and the day long. Well, some, in one case, multi-day, or maybe both cases, but the forums, the humanities forums that accompanied the opening of those exhibitions. And then there's, of course, also the I Ain't Lying magazine, which I think is probably the first publication to document the local civil rights movement outside of the newspapers, probably. Um, and, uh, and then what it is, this freedom that came with No Easy Journey in the opening, and then also uh, Romeo and Juliet production. There may be other things, but in telling the people's story, telling, I think, is yeah. the one that was the several day that you're thinking of. Um, yeah, and I just and uh, picturing our past. I mean, not picture no easy journey. There was the play, and then mm -hmm. there was the forum, and mm -hmm. so um, can we talk about those programs and how they developed and sort of the community context? Yeah, that's just one quick point to to, uh, to what what was saying about how you know. The larger community don't seem to recognize the culture that exists in relationship to, you know, s the suppressed community, right? I mean, there's no other classical example than the blues. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the Rolling Stones got their name from Muddy Waters, right up the road here. They came out of Mississippi in the Delta, okay? Uh, 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 Eric Clapton, you know, them boys, all the more blues things that came out of the Delta, right? Okay, they embraced them. 
When over here, we in the United States were saying the blues was a bunch of crap. Over in Europe, them brothers was having a good time hanging out with them old brothers. They used to go over there and play in them clubs, man. They were superstars and shit, right? The Beatles. I mean, okay, I mean, the Yardbirds. I mean, you, you can go, the list go on and on and on. And any of them, any of them rich white boys <laughs> that made all of that money, okay, if they tell the truth, they will say that the roots of their stuff came out of the blues, out of, out of the blues. So you, you, you're so right. I mean, our culture is rich. You know, and, and and when people tell us that it don't amount to a hill of beans, right? Well, that's a bunch of bunk. Yeah. All right, yeah, you know, be, Beatles open for a little, little rich. Yeah, a little rich guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I mean, look what James Brown did when the Beatles come over here. Right. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, classic. I mean, those are classic case and points, right? Yeah. Brown, hey, welcome to America. You know, yeah. I mean, our the, the rich, the culture was rich. And I think what Mississippi Culture Crossroads did here locally, right? Okay, mm -hmm. and in Panama we had a lot of discuss about this, right? The whole issue, again, of race reconciliation and how we get the white folks to come to the table and say, our stuff just good as your stuff. It wasn't an issue about, the, the side always said, what's good and what's bad. It wasn't an issue about that American Bandstand, Soul Train. Okay? American Bandstand, different. Soul Train, different. They are, they are not, one is not better than the other. It's how people express themselves. You know, it's how people express themselves, right? And so, they both should be complimented and be a part of history. With the exhibits, okay. I believe picturing our past came first, right? Yes. Mm. Uh, picturing our past, there was a photographer named James <laughs> Allen, or some Allen, <laughs> Mr. Allen. Yeah. Um, Briscoe Allen. Right? Yeah, right. Um, in the early 1900s, he had a view camera took zillions of glass negatives of this community, and a lot of them still existed, both locally and some of them were already at archives. So we said, hey, not every little town has a photographer who took pictures of the community in the 1900s. So we got a little money um, from the Humanities Council and put together an exhibit of somewhere in the 20s, um, more than that, yeah. I mean, about 50. Yeah. Photographs that Mr. Allen had taken. And those, I used to say to people, that's one picture of what this community looked like at a certain time. Now, Mr. Allen was a very wealthy white man. He was in government. He sold, among other things, Chevrolets. So those photos were taken through his eye. He held the camera. And we got a lot of flack from members of the black community who said those photos don't, I don't know, those photos don't picture us well. They don't depict us. We are living in, uh, pretty minimal housing and Mr. Allen's got a two-story entry to his house and all this kind of business. There were pictures of black men fishing. What do you call it? Um, Saning. Yeah. Um, anyway, we got a lot of flack from members of the black community for celebrating Mr. Allen's photos and they're still over at City Hall now. Within a year of that, we were beginning the work on No Easy Journey, the civil rights exhibit that is across the street. And all of a sudden, the people we were getting flack from were different. We were getting flack from the white folks <laughs> about celebrating this story. And we were working with Patty Black at the Old Capitol Museum, and we were trying to get it right. Local stories, pictures, things that could tell that story. And after one day when James and I, um, who often were the brunt of people's From both sides. anger. Um, well, maybe we, we ought to mention at this point that uh, James was for a long stretch the president of Cultural Crossroads right. while you were the executive right. director. So, so I guess yeah. it was reasonable that we got the flag. <laughs> um, but James said, why, when we celebrate our history, is it that old mess? 
And that's exactly what people were saying. Yeah. Why are you putting that old mess mm -hmm. in the courthouse? Yeah. I think it's also important to say that even though Cultural Crossroads always welcomed anybody, regardless mm -hmm. of race, that it was perceived in some ways as leaning towards the black community, probably. Or certainly sure. whites were much more reluctant to participate. Sure. And picturing our past was the first real embrace by mm -hmm. some of the white community in terms of being willing to work with cultural crossroads, right? Well, when you I mean, left out of history, of when you left out of history, right, and you are looked on as a footnote, right, and you never put any resources into documenting any of the history of 80% of the people who live here, obviously, you know, you got to step up to the plate and get, get you know, I mean, we're behind here. Your stuff has been documented time and time again. All of these buildings, right, around here that black folks built, right, that you live in, all right, that's that's part of black history, but it's never been documented. Okay, that's what I'm saying. You know, uh, it, it's it's the it's the racism and the arrogance. Okay, to say that you are not worth anything. Okay, you know, I mean, we we are here. We are human beings. Look at us. And in conjunction with that exhibit, No Easy Journey, we hired Nia Watkins, a poet and playwright, to write a play, um, What It Is This Freedom? Is that what? Yeah, yeah. What It Is This Freedom. Nia said I'd learn to say it someday. Um, at any rate, Nia wrote that, and we hired a director, a professional director from Harvard School of whatever, and um, to come in and do it. So we had a celebration of it. We didn't just slap stuff on the wall. Mm -hmm. We gave people an opportunity to see a play and then to have a conversation about what that history is and means and how it's part of the community. I guess part of what I was thinking about is it seemed like with the Allen photos picturing our past that at least some whites in the community embraced that and portrayed it as the beginning of a new interracial collaboration. Am I right about that? Well, I think the Main Street, Main um, Street, the whole uh, economic development piece. Al, what was his name? Hollingsworth. Hollingsworth. Al Hollingsworth was the head of the Main Street organization, and yeah. he. Um, yeah. What? No, you're right. I was just thinking about something. Go ahead, Tommy. I'm sorry. He was actively involved in the the whole uh, picturing our past. Choosing the photos. Yeah, choosing the photos and. He, he helped build some of the display panels and things like that, paint them at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, as part of the forum for that, we in invited um, Alan Trachtenberg from Yale to come down and to talk about photography and uh, the uses of photography, and re repurposing photography and things like that. And. He was um, wined and dined and fated by the the white community and invited to come back whenever he wanted to and, and so on and so forth. So when we got around to um, No Easy Journey, we invited Alan back again and he came. Because and we had those photos from the highway patrol and, and others. That and so. Alan, after the, the weekend was over, came up to me and said, what, what's going on here? He said, I, the last time I was here, everybody was very friendly. Nobody will talk to me now. <laughs> and and uh, Patty explained to him <laughs> what, <laughs> what was going on. What should on. have been obvious. Yeah, he crossed uh, the tracks. Yeah, he <laughs> crossed the tracks. Exactly. And we've had you know, similar experiences from others. We always tried with our forums to try to to bring some outside voices to bear on the what what the value of whatever it is that we were trying to do and to analyze it and to stimulate conversation. And um, sometimes they found it easier to do than other times. And Trachtenberg, although he's white, is a just one example because we had many uh, many black uh, commentators uh, and analyzers who well we've just okay. slid over Roland in talking about the quilts I right. mean of course you yeah. know we, we knew about that though but yeah. not now yeah okay I mean, sure I think we'll, we'll definitely address that mm -hmm. um, okay. and talk about that but with um with picturing our past and no easy journey what's the organization trying to do with those exhibits why do they matter to the community why are they important okay 
I, you know, I, I think man, at that time what we were trying to do again was trying to mend the community and trying to do it by way of the cult of arts and the culture, right? And and working in conjunction with you know with Patty and the members of the board. But uh, the mayor, okay, again, you got to go back to, to that time frame, right? Okay, the Grand Gulf monies were uh, we were headed toward bankruptcy because they had taken the money away, all right? the grant of money, the state legislature, right? And so we were faced with having to reach a compromise, some kind of compromise with the powers to be, all right? And what, and what, and what was that going to be? So here comes Boogie the Boogie the mayor, James Beasley, right? He comes over and all of a sudden now he wants to sit down around the table and negotiate, right? Well, so he came to my office. Now, why he came to my office as opposed to going to some supervisor, I don't know, and but he did. What was your job at that I was, point? I was the county planner then. Okay, I was the county planner. And he came down and said, talking about how we got to get along and I've done some things that was wrong in the past and blase, blase, you know, confessing, like, you know. And so <laughs> I'm saying, you know, I'm you know, scaring the shit out of me, man. What is going on? And so I'm sitting there listening to him, right? And I said, well, Mr. Mayor, what you want me to do, <laughs> right? He said, talk to your supervisor. I said, well, yeah. We, we. So we got to save that grant gun money. And, and but see, he, yeah, he, he was, he, he was, you know, he was old, old gangster, old, old school gangster back when, way back when, right? Beely was, right? And uh, racist too. And so he wanted to, he wants to get his cut of the money before, cause the city wasn't getting any money from grand gun for nothing, right? And so uh, anyway, make a long story short, okay, you know, uh, there was a coalition that was built, a fragile coalition that was built between the city and the county and the leadership here locally, right, to sell the Grand Gulf situation to the point that there was some pickets down at Grand Gulf, right, and eventually it will sell. So we got X number of dollars. Then he... And let me just say, at okay. this point you've got a... The county government is majority black, uh -huh. and the city government is still controlled by, by the white community, yes, yes, sort of in continuation yes, of the civil rights yes. movement. It is the last the remnants. County yeah. dynamic. Yeah, that's the last remnants of power for the whites, the city of Port Gibson. Okay, mm -hmm. the county, the black and took over the county. Okay. And so that's what that tentative compromise, y yes, the coalition. Exactly. That's that's what that was about, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so he ready to play ball now. Okay, so we uh, uh, we sit down and talk, and then. He sends his wife, okay, and so now all of a sudden, you know, she becomes the, the, the emissary. Thank you. <laughs> all right, and so <laughs> as a result of that, uh, uh, she said, uh, "I said, well, you know, how are we gonna institutionalize this piece? Because we got to work within a structure, right? And so we thought we came with the Main Street concept, right? And it was kind of, it was kind of." popular in the state at that time. And so said, so we gonna, he said, I got my, uh, I know some guy from Connecticut, and that was how Al Hollins worked. And so they brought him in to be the mainstream manager, because it had to be sponsored by the city. They, it couldn't be sponsored by the county. It was a, it was a city concept, it came out of cities. And so Al came in then and started working, right? And and it never fails, man, okay? I, and I, 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 Because it's the fact. And he came in, you know, knowing everything to do. I mean, you know, he do this, we need to do this, we need to do that, right? So I'm sitting here listening, right? I said, we're not compromising. You are dictating. You know, we need to sit down and talk about this. I mean, uh, the library you talked about, right, was all white, okay? Uh, a bunch of little white women was on the board, all right? Now that they got to get out of City Hall because they got to renovate City Hall, why are we going to put the new library? Mm, a chance now for compromise. Now a chance to expand the library board. Now a chance to do something downtown. Revamp the old downtown building. Still part of the Main Street program. Rehab the building because all the downtown area was blighted because of we just came out of the out of the boycott. Okay, on, on at the last end of the boycott prior to it being selling what eighty four I believe it was eighty two eighty two and, uh, and, uh, and downtowns are dying all over the yeah, country. Yeah. but most of here though it was I mean it was this place was blighted man it was it was gone all right? and so we got big time white folks from D C coming down y'all know the names uh, them guys uh, at the National Trust and stuff mm -hmm. coming down mm -hmm. big I mean we all up in white folks houses and stuff, right? Drinking wine and talking <laughs> shit, you know, and, and, and you know, getting along, you know, acting like human beings. <laughs> right? You know, and, and, and all this going on and, and, and all this going on. So make my story short, okay, basically what happened at the end of the, of the process, right? We were able to use the Main Street program, work with Beasley in the city, right? And 
and and that was it was it was that were issues along the way. You know, you always got to you know fight for your position, right? But we were able to do the building, okay? Make the connection with Mississippi Cultural Crossroads, bring it into the mix, right? Able to get more funding for Mississippi Cultural Crossroads, right? To help expand the programs, cause the part of the uh, no easy no no easy uh, pitching our pass, okay? All right, and, and also the. Uh, play we did in mm -hmm. Cal. I think he was in part using that one when you, mm -hmm. in, in, in a play. Okay, and we got community interaction going on because there were local whites that were part of the play. Mm -hmm. Okay, and some other people can talk about those experiences, right? But I'm still saying we're trying to develop good relationships, and somehow or another, you know, we came out of that whole process with a somewhat stable cultural crossroads that had made a point. Downtown redevelopment. Okay, we still ain't what we're supposed to be, but we're making a little bit of progress. Okay, and then it changed. Hey, you, can we talk some about that? I mean, I don't want to monopolize so, so the conversation. When, so when you so so you put a picture in your path, picture in our past, mm -hmm. which is something that the white community felt strongly about, was excited about, wanted to see happen, mm -hmm. right. and at least some members of the black community were not thrilled with it. But mm -hmm. Cultural Crossroads decided it was important to do. But they did live and went along with it. Mm -hmm. okay, and did. why does Cultural Crossroads decide that's important to do? I, uh, first of all, it's available. Yeah. It, it, it's local. Mm -hmm. It's uh, historical. And it's, uh, it involves the arts. So it, it just seemed like a, a real good fit with yeah. uh, what Cultural Crossroads was trying to do. Yeah. And as we, as we worked on it and saw more and more and more of the photographs, and I'm, I've been told later that we didn't see all the photographs, that the, the more racist photographs were already censored out and, and we never saw them, uh, including one that involved the um, The lynching of uh, a black man from outside the outside in the in the county, mm -hmm. a little bit uh, that happened in the uh, around 1910, 1912, mm -hmm. something like that. Who was lynched? Do you know? I've forgotten the name now. It's been a long time. But he talked about. The, I have an interview with. Um, Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen, yeah. Uh, the son of the, the son of the photographer. Who talked about how? Um, that would be Jimmy Allen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. how he was um, chased from where he committed whatever crime he did. He was accused of raping a woman, and he was chased from Hermanville all the way around the county, across mm -hmm. the in, into a lake somewhere down around Bruinsburg, mm -hmm. and he. Um, was <laughs> he he got into the lake and was breathing through a straw according to this and they knew he had gotten onto the lake so they got in a rowboat and went out there and then he came up behind them and they shot him and then they brought him into town on a board of some kind and displayed his body right out here in front of the courthouse for a day or two and the people came and took their pictures, and, and Mr. Allen's father had been one of the photographers who, who photographed that incident. That, that we didn't see at all. We never saw that photograph, but apparently it was shown to Trachtenberg when he was here. They thought a man of his importance would, should see that photograph. Why? Well, they, they were, I know that they were courting Trachtenberg because they wanted to get the materials in a sense out of the hands of cultural crossroads and into some the hands of somebody with a prominent name so that they could get them published and make money off of them. And they thought that he would appreciate those pictures? I have no I, idea, we, we Patty. Can't, I, I can't, can't even begin can't to wrap my head what, around that. Why? But I, I mentioned it just to, to say that we, we had a lot of photographs with a lot of different subject matter. And not a lot of them involved black folks. Uh, there was one that some people found offensive because it depicted 
uh, well, two of them actually, because they depicted, uh, no, just one, depicted uh, a, a black woman in a, a kind of menial position as a uh, caregiver to this young white Jimmy Allen. Um, but there were some others. The, one was a genre picture of, uh, I think, four black men uh, shooting dice, were they? Yeah. And then there was. Uh, yeah, one of the pictures that I thought was among the best of the, of the shots was the, the fishing, but the the black men who were fishing were naked, and they were depicted that way. Uh, I thought, without any particular prejudice to them, but it was uh, not seen that way by everybody in the community. Um, so it was it was really the. Um, the blacks felt, the blacks who complained at least, felt that uh, we had allowed this black man to show them in ways that this were white not, man. white man, to, to depict them in ways that were not um, the best and that uh, therefore they didn't think that we should continue to support that kind of thing. You ask why. It seemed to me that that community was and is still incredibly divided. And I thought that maybe if we could look as a community at what we looked like in various times and through various sets of eyes, we could figure out. I mean, Mr. Allen's photos showed a lot about what life was like. He was not privy to black folks celebrating or anything, so that part of the picture is missing. But um, so I just thought that, and, and what Dave said, they were available. I mean, we wouldn't have gone after some photographic exhibit if we'd had to grab a photo from here and there and whatever, but, but we had these. Them, and there was a lot of conversation about um, juggling back and forth when you talk about compromise. I mean, we had all these photos that we were looking at most of them were four by fives that we were looking at and then printed much larger. And so Al was at the table. Al wanted downtown pictures. You know, Dave was at the table. He wanted images that showed people. And I mean, so anyway, there was a lot of give and take. Had I sat at the table alone, I would have picked a different 50 photographs. But we were all in it together. and. I don't think that's a problem. It just spreads out the point of view of that um, well, and at exhibit. The, you know, obviously, though, at the same time, during that whole period, we were displaying the work of Roller Freeman mm -hmm. and uh, a prominent black photographer, so that it wasn't as if we, were, we weren't showing uh, as, as many sides of Thing. I think the most important thing we thought would happen was there would be a dialogue about race. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. And, exactly. and there, yeah. exactly. I found that the, the, the black folks who wanted, who objected, were not willing to say that out loud, not in public. I mean, not where, where white folks were present anyway. Uh, and the white folks didn't think there was any problem. So you know, the, the dialogue never really got going on the surface, but I think it started to roil the underground a little bit. Yes. Those, those forms, man, I never forget those forms, but let it be a hundred. When we sit over there and we had those forms, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and all the people from the white community came in and the black community came in and they talked about this community, right? Percy was there, Gage was there, Beasley was there, okay? And, and it, it, was, it was so apparent to me, right, that y'all just don't get it. Mm -hmm. You just don't damn mm -hmm. get it. I think that's the forum that mm. went with um, No Easy Journey. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it's yeah. got Mayor yeah. Beasley. Yeah. I mean, uh, Be Beasley's wife. Beasley's John wife, Beasley, John. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Robert Gage IV, the fourth, mm -hmm. fourth generation to be mm -hmm. president and owner of Port Gibson Bank. And uh, Percy Thornton, who is an African American Board of Supervisors mm -hmm. and previously a history teacher. Mm -hmm. And you, who as county planner and chair of Cultural Crossroads, talking about the community civil rights history, what the community looked like today, and vision for the future. And you were on one of those panels, were? Yeah, yes, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, we didn't create what was in place. See what I'm saying? And, and the white folks don't seem to get that. I mean, you created two equal societies. We didn't create that. And then when you create it, and then the fallout from it uh, grows, right, then you want to come back and blame somebody else for what you did. Okay, and we're saying, okay, look, we didn't create this. I mean, case in point, I'm going to classic example. Right. There's a dual educational system, okay, in this state for higher education. Okay, white folk, big time school, Ole Miss, all come. <laughs> okay, now, who created that institution? Wasn't no black folks. Okay, and so now, okay, 100 years later, okay, some decisions have got to be made a state as poor as this state can't support all these high institutions of learning. What are we going to do with them? All right? We're going to just cut out the black ones and save the white ones. And those blacks that can afford to go to Ole Miss, go there. Or you don't go. <laughs> you know, no. No, 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 no. We have to sit down and talk about this and the implications of this. And it needs to be understood that this was a monster that you created. Not a monster that we created, but we're willing to sit down with you and talk about how we need to solve this. But we got to have some parity here. And, and, well, you see what I'm saying? What? Yeah, I know. I mean, yeah. uh, the, the, I, I, I did attend uh, the, uh, the discussions. And, 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 but one of the things that I remember that, that one of the questions that came to my mind was uh, th- there was dialogue, but not there was talk of dialogue, but not of interaction. Yeah. Yeah. You see, and, and, and for change, you, you cannot have change with dialogue and no interaction. The whole question of social interaction is, 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 the, is the foundation for change, it seems to me. And that, it, it, it wasn't even visualized in in either community. It was not well visualized in either community. I, I need to say it that way. It was not well visualized in either commun- community. Yeah. The the pulling together of, of people to come together though was it was a great idea. Yeah. And in fact it was fairly well programmed. But then when the when you when the time comes for where do we go from here? Yeah. And that leads to, you know, that you have to be side by side or... Uh, or that the compromise has to go both ways? It, it has. And I, it, it has, but the, in, in a compromise between the powerful and the powerless, mm-hmm. what, who, who compromises mm-hmm. is the question, mm-hmm. right? I hate to try to be philosophic, but... <laughs> well, yeah. could, could I go on to talk a little bit about Romeo and Juliet? Because, I mean, it represented a very similar kind of thing, where inter- the interaction between white and black Yeah, community. hang on, let me just say, so, uh, so picturing our past was around 92? I think so. If you want to know for sure, I've got the and fine line of the No Easy so. Journey, I know, opened in December of 94. Okay, well, this this and is earlier. Julio was it earlier. was, it was, um, it began in 1988, and the performances were in 1989. But it was one of those things that happens once in a lifetime for an organization because we had the opportunity, and that's a, there's a backstory to that. But we had the opportunity to bring 11 highly trained professionals in theater to Port Gibson to plan a play with the cooperation of the community, a classic play revisioned through the eyes of the community today. And the play that was chosen was Romeo and Juliet. And when the Cornerstone Theater Company came to town, in November of 88, they began a casting call and people were auditioning and people were volunteering to, to serve on the, 
the the crew and to the the front office and stuff like that. To make the dresses. <laughs> yeah. To, to be a part of this thing. Carolyn's mom. Yeah. And, and a lot of the white community were just absolutely dumbstruck by this wonderful thing that was happening, all these <laughs> these bright Harvard kids coming into town to to help us do culture. Dumbstruck in a good way. <laughs> in a yeah. good way, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Clarify. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's all kinds Clarence. of dumbstruck. <laughs> <laughs> but then, when it became clear that Cornerstone Theater was going to cast their uh, lead uh, performer, uh, Amy Brenneman, a Amy Brenneman as Juliet, and cast Romeo as a, a local black high school student. That the <laughs> attitudes of the white community changed pretty quickly. Not all of them. Not yeah. all. But and one Amy. of them was the mayor's wife. And Amy's white. And Amy, yes, Amy is white. I forgot to mention that. In fact, all of them were white. Yeah. All of in them those days. in those days. So that was something that changed later in terms of Cornerstone's history. But there was still enough white participation in it to make it a, a, a community-wide uh, thing. And it showed for like, uh, 13, performances 13 performances in March, and everybody who was connected with it thought it was a, a, a great artistic success. Bill was a terrific director, and the um, we had one of those wonderful um, forums sponsored by the Humanities Mississippi Council. Humanities Council uh, in some upstairs room. I kept trying to remember where that was. Doesn't matter, of course, but I often Wasn't I can it picture. Wasn't just in the theater? I don't think it was. But I think it was in the theater. The discussion? Yeah. Yeah, it was in the yeah, theater. It was in the theater. It was in the theater up on the stage after the performance. Yeah, up were, on the stage. They were on the okay. stage and the audience was I don't know. audience. But that was really the one time that race became kind of overtly recognized as a source of. Uh, trouble, but also trouble that could be overcome by this kind of collaboration until the woman who played the, the mayor of uh, Mississippi, what was the town? Verona. Verona, Mississippi. Uh, tell me her name. Mary Curry. Mary Curry, who is you know the peacemaker at the end of the play who says you know this this has got to change this has got to change and so we'll all be together and shakes hands with or you know anyway it's a big peaceful reconciliation although people are dead <laughs> and um, sounds about right. right but anyway after at the discussion afterward Mary Curry stands up and says yeah you know this is all good and wonderful and good and so but you know tomorrow your son is going to walk past my son. My Alan. son Alan is going to walk past your your daughter, your daughter and Kathy Dodgen's daughter, and they won't speak to each other. And you know this will this will all be gone tomorrow. Forget about it. The, and awe and shock uh, among the white community. In my poor little heart too. <laughs> Because I was willing to believe that we, you know, we could progress from from that as a starting point, but um, I still think that to this day that that performance had an, an experience of putting that performance on had a huge impact on this community and uh, how uh, issues like that were dealt with. Even though these things that we've been talking about happened later, I think. Uh, they, they were provided with a, uh, a kind of floor to operate on. Maybe I don't know, but. Uh, but Mary was right. She just recognized that even though there had been months of people working together the way you have to work together and trust, if you're in theater together, even though that had happened, they had hashed out together language. I mean, whether, what's the 
Shakespeare's person. Um, anyway, whether they should use the word nigger or not in performance. And then there was all this discussion of history and what the word in, that Shakespeare used meant and blah, blah, blah. So that there were a lot of conversations like that that the cast and crew had input in. Um, they didn't always get the last word, but they had that kind of input. So there was, I think, genuine working together during that period. But Mary spoke to the reality that once this play is over, once Alan doesn't, because Cornerstone incorporated Alan and Dwayne Nash and a few of the, the little kids in the play, once there is not that mechanism, we will go back to our worlds, and that doesn't include our children going to school together but or anything. It was shortly after that that the first white students uh, auditioned for Peanut Butter and Jelly Who Theater, Who and uh, three were in one eight-person cast of uh, Peanut Butter and Jelly. Well, maybe we can talk about that another time, but. Uh, a, a local theater group that performed around the state, but yeah. Yeah. and didn't one of the cast members uh, from the the Harvard that Harvard group, mm -hmm. one of the local pe persons, join that cast? Yeah, uh, for a reunion show, they 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 right. did they did the production of the Winter's Tale that they right. performed at every spot they had performed in uh, during their tour of the United States. So. Yeah, uh, and it, it was the, the boy who played Romeo, Brinston. right? Brinston. So, so, so I brought that up as a, to show how uh, in, interventionist, yeah, can mm -hmm. ch how it can be, be both external and internal. Okay, <laughs> right? and we shouldn't be negative about this. And Carolyn's probably saying we have to quit. Yeah. But when when Winter's Tale came back here right. with Cornerstone and um, Brinston was coming back home. He'd been on the road right. with these guys for a while. And they're setting up in the empty lot across the road. Peanut Butter and Jelly had been inside rehearsing, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, because they were gonna do a little bit of a show for, for Cornerstone. Mm -hmm. So Dave had them back in here. So we had Jenny McKee with her long, long stringy blonde hair down to her waist. And Robert, um, I wouldn't call it stringy, but well, go ahead. all right, straight. <laughs> uh, Robert Hamlin. Those two had not seen each other since they had worked together. One black, one white. So they're standing out there in the middle of the street. Black male, white female. Black male, white female. Okay, sorry. Um, and they're standing out there where there used to be a stoplight in the middle of the street, hugging. Okay, <laughs> Al Hollingsworth came into the building and said, how can you allow Cornerstone to disrespect us like that? It was the day Cornerstone had arrived back in town. And I said, Al, what are you talking about? So we went out there and Ginny and Robert were still talking. And I said, oh, those two? That's Ginny McKee. Her dad works down at Grand Gulf and that's Robert. They are peanut butter and jelly. But you see, the assumption yeah. was that if there was a black and white standing teenager standing out there, it was these outsiders who had done that. And I, th I, th Not I, th their I think own. that's a crucial point, Pat, because I go back to what you were saying earlier, man. I mean, most of the kids, it was very few local kids mm -hmm. that would participate. Most mm -hmm. of the people that were white were from outside of the community. And, and there was, I mean, I mean, there might be some figures, but Chad McKay might be an, uh, uh, an exception, right? And it might be one other kid locally. Let, let me ask, so with um, Romeo and Juliet was maybe the strongest white participation in the theater stuff that Cultural Crossroads has done? Well, Carolyn might be able to one, speak to the one that the, Joe the, Carson, the deal rocked the, up. Uh, the deal the, rocked the, up. Maya. Yeah, that Maya, Maya directed. Maya. That okay. Joe wrote. Yeah. And that comes later. Yeah, yeah. much yeah, later. Much later. Me, much later. Yeah, so, much, yeah. but but when you go to what it is, this freedom. So Romeo and Juliet's like 88? 88. 88. 88. 88. 88. 89. 88. 89. And what it is, this freedom, which was with um, 
the opening of No Easy Journey, so that's mm -hmm. December 94. I remember there was the little boy who was Francis Nelson's grandson. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, too, yeah. his dad owned a service station. Grandfather. Grandfather. Yeah. He was one of the only white. Right. Chad, as far as Chad was concerned, was born to do theater. And Chad pretty much got what he wanted out of his parents. And he knew. Chad used to come do art with us. Um, he was kind of the same age as LeConte. And anyway, Chad wanted to be in that play. So he came and auditioned for Tim Banker. And Tim said, sure, we can find, I mean, the kids got skills. So they um, cast him as a senator from before Reconstruction or something, I don't know. Not a kid's part, but Chad got it. Well, his mom came in a couple days after he'd been cast and he said, she said, people are telling me that I shouldn't let Chad do this. This will not be good for Chad. Chad will be mistreated. He may be harmed. He may be. And I just said, Melissa, he's been coming to our art programs after school. Has he been harmed? Has he, you know, is there a problem? And she said, no. And I said, well, then why would you assume this is not a safe space for your kid? And Melissa let him hang in there. And and the night the opening night of that play, his mom and dad were here and Mr. and Mrs. Cleveland were here to see their grandson perform. But was there any other local white audience? Yeah, we had some. Um Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, not a lot, yeah. but there are people who want to do theater, like your father. There are people that want to do theater. And if you live in this little town, mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of opportunities. So if you really want that, you come and you do theater. So most of our white participation in theater was people who really wanted to do theater. And then their families come, yeah. you know. Yeah. So James, when did you get involved with Cultural Crossroads? I think the first time I came to work, when you were over from high school. Mm hmm Yeah. Uh, uh, over there in that little... Quantity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wandered through that one through there one day. So I was like, what all this going on up in here, man? It was just kids doing everything. It was just like bees, little bees, just all over the place. They were doing iron line. They were doing photographs. They were doing uh, art. silk screening. Yeah, mm -hmm. art and stuff. I mean, it just all kinds of stuff. And I said, damn. And a white girl. What in it? <laughs> so let me get up here and find what the hell going on over here. <laughs> but 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 you know, it it was it was beautiful. It was beautiful, man. It was beautiful. I mean, what Patty had them kids doing, man. It was these kids. I don't think Patty even realized the impact that she's had in this community in terms of children that have gone through here. You know, I mean, like little, little Red. Remember, you know, what's his name? Lena's little boy, little brother, right? I mean, right, right. right. Yeah, him. I'm just, but it's not just him, it was just school gobs of kids who got to do stuff they never would have had the opportunity to do. Okay? And it and it was again yeah, a safe place mm -hmm. for them to come. And we insisted from the start that every kid, every adult should be welcome. Mm. I mean, there was a time when Jimmy Smith, who was then mm. president of the school board, mm -hmm. came to me and said, I mean, we were always struggling to pay whatever bills we had. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy came and said, you know, um, I can just give you a big space in the school. We can build you a dark room. You can do that in the school. And I said, well, yeah, but if we do it in the school, I'll be teaching photography. We won't be doing cultural crossroads. And it wasn't long after that that a president, and I have no idea which one, because they used to come and go at, at Chamberlain Hunt Academy, came to me the same way and said, you know, if you'll do that up on the hill at Chamberlain Hunt, we'll give you a dark room. We'll build you a dark room. Because at that point, we had three kids from CAJ who were um, coming to Cultural Crossroads. And I just said, no, that's not what we're about. And so we didn't do it either way. Okay, can I make an observation on that? Sure. I, mean, I never knew that happened, right? <laughs> but I tell you this, it was a wise decision you made mm -hmm. not to, because you would have been 
the slave mm -hmm. of both of them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? And you would not have had to do, been able to do none of what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. What you would have been doing is what they wanted you to do. Exactly. Okay. And especially Jim. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting to me mm -hmm. that with all of this, um, the last big show that we did was uh, what <clears throat> how the deal rocked up. Yeah where we actually, we commissioned a playwright, Joe Carson, to come into town, listen to people's stories, and then create a drama based on that, that local people could perform. We hired a professional director to come in and, and direct. And in and among the stories that we, we dramatized was 